Welcome to Integration TV, the first English television for Somalis around the world, and now broadcasting across Somalia on Somali national television. Television Karanka Somalia. So Dawada, Magaiga, Wahana Nahmi Saeed Nalea. I'm so happy today that I'm excited to share with you a very special person who is dear to me, who is my father. And many of you guys always connect with me on social media and you know the stories that I share about the history of my family and our history coming to Canada. Well, today you'll get an exclusive interview uh, to, with my father and we'll talk about the history of Somalia. And um, he was the former governor in Somalia for the area of Gilgadud and he's just retired after 30 years of supporting and um, helping many Somalis who immigrated to Canada. Please welcome my father, Ahmed Saeed Nalea, to Integration TV as we have a little chat about history. So, uh, Dad, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for joining us. It's kind of weird to be interviewed by your daughter. Wouldn't you say so? It's great. It's great. <laughs> Mashallah. So, Abe, um, how are you? How was retirement life? Well, retirement is not easy, but uh, you deserve it after a long time of work. Yes. And uh, all the responsibilities the children has grown up. Yes. They produce their own children. Mm -hmm. And things are much better. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, Abe, um, I want to thank you, number one, for agreeing to come on my TV show. I know it's hard for many people to share their life stories. And um, what I'm excited about is sharing your journey in Somalia. Um, you were born in Yemen and you went back as a Somali diaspora in 1968 to Somalia. Tell us about the early years of your life and your activism, why you decided to go back to Somalia. Because so many people in the world now are excited about the rebirth of Somalia. Well, the reason I went back to my ancestors' home I was born there. My father was raised as a child there in, Som in Aden, Yemen. My aunt was there. She was married to an Arab. My uncle has also married an Indian woman. And he had children from an Indian person as well. And we have an inter integrated with the people of Yemen, irrespective of where they came from, whether they came from India, mm -hmm. Pakistan, or other parts of the Arab world. But in, in spite of that, uh, I kept my culture. My father was a very strong person. He used to advise me after I started to work in high school, to f advise me to go back to Somalia every summer holiday. And I used to go every two years, once back to Somalia, go to and live as a nomad in rural areas of Somalia, of Ergabo, Somaliland, which is wow. called Somaliland. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother, Fadma Ali Hagar, was the one who used to take care of me at wow. that time. So you were what they call Dakan Alice. <laughs> Dakan Alice, that's what Did you guys use it. that term back then? Yeah. Well, sorry? Did they use the same term back oh, then? Oh, yeah, Dakan Alice. Keep, Always. Keep the culture, yeah. Oh. The, keep the culture. Uh, or reinstitute the culture. That's yes. the, that was the purpose of it, you see. Yes. So you used to go back in the summers. What was your first summer that you went back? What was your impression? Oh, the first one was very difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I was uh, supposed to get up in the morning, <laughs> look after hearts of uh, camels, <laughs> uh, cows, uh, sheep, goats mm -hmm. and uh, come back and then in the in the afternoon get some milk from them yeah, they milk the cows for you or the animal or the cow or the camel and then you have it and you continue until the sunset comes down yeah. and then you go back and take the animal back to the shelter so this was a boot camp training that's it it was back uh, because my father used to believe that we must keep the culture. Wow. And this is where you're going to end up. And practically, that's why, why I ended up in Somalia after the, the British left Aden colony. So this is interesting. So your parents left Somalia during the Darwish War. 
Yeah. And you guys settled in Aden, and that's where you were born. And then you came back because of another war. Yeah. In the 1968, back to Somalia. Yeah, I came there, and uh, I settled down, and I started to work, and I got a good jobs because I had uh, the language capability and the education. Mm -hmm. And I became a uh, representative for the World Food Program there. Wow. And uh, I used to, the World Food Program brought a very viable project for the Somali people at that time to build schools, roads, hospitals, depending on themselves. The, the people has to contribute to build these things mm -hmm. by labor, by financial contributions. And this is how we, I used to work as a settlement counselor. As, 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 as a community development officer mm -hmm. to assist the people to contribute and also to put their efforts together. Wow. So when you went back and you started to rebuild your life back again in Somalia, before that you told me you were an activist, like you were one of the youth activists back in Aden? Oh, in Aden, I was. First, the Somali national movement started uh, in Aden, for instance, mm -hmm. Somali National uh, SNL, mm -hmm. Somali National Liberation mm -hmm. Front, well, first started there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was or what SNL, to help Somali the Somali National Movement. Yeah, that was what to get like get more people to come together in Somalia. To, to come together, mm -hmm. and the Somalis they were tribes, mm -hmm. clans, different clans, not tribes, clans, mm -hmm. and to come together and work together against the British colonizations and f fight together for the unification of Somali people, yes. irrespective of where they are. Because Somalis people were colonized by the Ethiopians one side, the Italians one side, the British on the north, and also in NFD, yes. Northern Frontier Districts, wow. in Kenya. Majority of the people that were there are Somalis. Mm -hmm. So all this division, so you guys were youth outside the country trying to yes. help the people understand the power of unity. Yeah. Yes, we had an inspiration from Jamal Abdul Nasser movement in the Arab world at that okay. time. The anti-colonization movement of the Jamal Abdul Nasser. Amazing. Yeah. So this is, then you went back to Somalia and then did you feel like you could still continue those activities? Like, how was the reality on the ground compared to when you were outside as a diaspora? Well, the reality was this because there was at that time when I went back, mm -hmm. luckily, a year after me being there, mm -hmm. uh, Siad Barret took over the power. Yes. Took it by military coup. Uh, the Is that kind of like a more when they started the new nationalist movement? Na a new nationalist movement. Mm -hmm. The president of Somalia was killed mm -hmm. in a very bad accident, mm -hmm. or very bad way. Mm -hmm. and, and he then, was assassinated, right? Assassinated. Yeah, in, and in Las Anod, actually. I went to the yeah. actual area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But that's yeah. like a whole other thing. Yeah. But, so yeah. he was killed, and then the new coup, military coup took the over. The military took over in yes. order to save the country from civil war. And, but he, they're supposed to give it back to the people again. Yes. But they didn't. They, they liked it mm -hmm. and they wanted to keep the power and they continue to keep the power for over 23 years. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go into a little bit of that history and how you became part of the government right after this break. Um, you're watching Integration TV on Somali National Television. I'm Hoda Naleya. We'll be back right after these messages. When tradition calls and you yearn for the new sights, sounds, and the beauty of our land, let us take you there. With Ocean Airlines, we bring back the Somali airline experience with new technology, reliable services, and 24-hour online booking. Ocean Airlines is changing the game. Get ready for the sweet taste of life. Be a flying nomad. Be with Ocean Airlines, your gateway to the motherland. Book, pay, and check in online at ocean airlines.com. Hi, I'm Ramla, owner of Studio Glam. 
Welcome to our new facility where we offer hair, makeup, and henna in one location. Visit us at your local one-stop shop, Studio Glam, hair, makeup, and henna. Hano Academy. Halal am badnen iya hadiyad ban sida iya hamigi na bal shakta. Hirfada la hanti iya ilmiya hibanaya. Hiba iwa xana hay hirfada an hore u xadirin xarun u xabraso. Shahadan u hay san hirfadi iya maxan kaharan kara. Hano Academy. Hiba iya horan u hal gamo shahada jamaad u hanti. Haya shayna an hore marshu hamigi gu iya hay. Iya maxan kaharan kara Hano Academy. Hiba iya dor sunan kwa hamina iya ingiris kwa hadli diisa. Oh ho shayad iya wahab saama iya halna kamashay ga hinga diisa. Maxan kaharan kara Hano Academy. Wa hili nki idin kuwa da habona Hano Academy u xanna ka hili kartaan. Upgrading skills. Academic progression, personal and social development, workplace experience for skills development, vocational training, entrepreneurship with company formation and business startups. The man معلمين تنا و أجانب حموجان أو هاو ذي ملان هانو أكاديمي واحد كتر الله إنتو ده حيسز جوز كبنا دري سبيت الكديك فير. بحي ففاين إنت عدير واحد بقان كرتا ويبسيت كم عهد كا أو أه www. هانوأكاديمي. com. Welcome back to Integration. Thanks so much for still continuing to join us. Um, it was always interesting to have dynamic Somalis around the world join us for a deep conversation. So today I'm excited that we have my father, Ahmed Saeed Nalea, joining us to talk about his history in Somalia. Welcome back, Dad, again. It feels weird still to interview my father, but this is amazing. So thank you again, Ape. Um, so we were, before the break, we were talking about the fact that, you know, when the military coup took over, you got into um, the government after that? Well, before the military coup, mm -hmm. I was a community development officer yes. in the northern part of Somalia. Okay. And I was responsible for development projects, like build, building new hospitals, yes. roads, schools, for the community. Mm -hmm. And the community was supposed to participate, and I used to urge the community to participate in building these projects yes. and contribution financially and labor-wise as well. Mm -hmm. And they were doing it very well, the people. They had intuitism and for these projects, and they used to use the project used to be called self-help projects. Right, so promoting self-reliance. Self-reliance. Yes. Yeah, you need hospital, build it for yourself. Yes. Yeah, the government don't have financial uh, in a financial, uh, what do you call support yes. to build a hospital for you, dude, contribute your labor. Seems like we're, we're repeating history because the same thing is happening now where the government doesn't have resources now, so people are having to be forced to build hospitals, schools, and all those things. It is inevitable. The people has to contribute because Somalia, the, f the financial issues is not there. Yeah. much. It will take a long time. We don't have oil yet. Mm -hmm. The oil exploration is still going on, mm -hmm. but we don't know when it's going to be explored mm -hmm. and produced at the same time. Yes. So in the meantime, people have to rely on themselves. That's Anything true. they need, they have to contribute to building it. Yes, of course. So tell me how, what made you decide to get in the government, actually start working with the government? When, when I started to work with the government, I started to work as a community development officer. Mm -hmm. Gradually, I, uh, the project got expanded, mm -hmm. and then I was given the responsibility to be responsible for half of the country, Somalia, land, mm -hmm. uh, which is Hargeisa province, mm -hmm. Bur'o, mm -hmm. and Bari. Mm -hmm. which, is, is, which is used to be called at that time Majertania. Mm -hmm. I was responsible for all these projects in order to develop these areas and the people to contribute for their own well-being. Wow. Mm. So tell us, let's go to the time when you became the governor of Galgadud. What was happening in the country at that time? At that time, Siad Barret took over the power. And it was a good thing because the people were so dis, uh, what they were disappointed 
because uh, because they were afraid of a civil war that may take place because after the killing of the president himself mm -hmm. and the people were so afraid and so uh, what do you call it worried about the future of the country they were afraid of civil war the military took over the power mm -hmm. and the people and the people supported it mm -hmm. in order because the people wanted peace and stability yes. and the military brought peace and stability yes. for a long time for the first 10 years it was good after that Syed Barre remained in power for too long and instead of giving power back to the people mm -hmm. he started to rule himself yes. he became the complete dictator yes. and then he forced the people to go to war with Ethiopia Oh, yes, okay. And that the war of Ethiopia has contributed considerably to the deterioration of the situations economically and uh, security-wise in the country. Wow. So at that time, um, basically, when you were the governor in Gulgadud, what was happening? I know there's one event that we talked about that was very instrumental in your career that you found that you and the president kind of didn't agree on certain things. Um, so tell me about that event. What would you say at that time was was a young man that something happened with the local community because you were there in Dusa Mareb at that time? And the, I was the governor of Dusa Mareb. Mm -hmm. The principle that the government has declared and they were uh, enforcing it yeah. was that if you kill somebody, mm -hmm. you have to be killed, taken to court and be killed. Yes. And uh, n not the Somali system that used to be to pay compensation yes. in camels yes. or livestock or financially to the families that has or the tribe that has lost their son. And the government started to do that. Mm -hmm. But they started to renegate from that, mm -hmm. to go back from this issue, and they started to accept. Oh, let the people solve their problem. Ah. So Siad Barre, four years before that, he has killed three persons from the Ayr clan mm -hmm. for killing at a one Marehan boy. Mm -hmm. So, the, uh, again, Marihan has killed three Ayr and I said they have to go to court. Let, them, let us take them to court, bring them to court. Mm -hmm. let them. So, uh, but the two clans meet together mm -hmm. and they said we will take compensation. I said I don't accept it mm -hmm. as a governor. Mm -hmm. It's against the law. Okay, Syed Barres told me, called me and told me, if this is the people wants, let them do it. I said, it's yesterday we killed. Yes. We did justice. Today we have to do the justice. He said, oh, okay. I said, okay, if this is the situation, I, I can't be a governor of a people. I can't rule, I be a governor for people mm -hmm. that are dissatisfied. Yes. With injustice. Because you were actually on the ground, so people would come to your office and of course. and the grievance, right, would be yeah. against that. Mm -hmm. uh, as a governor, I'm solving the daily problems or daily issues every day in my office. Mm -hmm. And you can't, what are you going to tell the persons? Yeah. You can't flip flop. No, you can't. Yeah. So instead of, uh, because you follow the rule of the law at the time and yeah. some people didn't feel comfortable with that, do you think that kind of started to make you think about why you were there? Because sometimes when you're a diaspora, you have a different way of life and different way of thinking than people back home. Would you agree? Well, personally, my conscience was satisfied. Yes. And I'm satisfied. Mm -hmm. my, the position I took is good for my Conscious Inshallah. and my country and the people yes. and the justice system. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing, Dad. And that's what it's about, right? You have to be comfortable with your decisions. In of life. course, of yeah. course. So now let's talk about 
the time when Ethiopia came. Because I just went to Las Anod recently. I was in Ari Ade, mm. and there was a 90-year-old man sitting under a tree. And when he heard my name, he was like, Kale, 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 Kale. I was like, what is, why is he calling me Kale, Kale? last time and I was like what so tell us about the time what happened when you and a few other government officials decided to leave the country at that time well at that time because Siad Barre after the war with Ethiopia he supposed because he 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 guard he he, he uh, what do you call it, uh, led the people for, yes. to the war. He, we failed in the war, yeah. and it was clear from the beginning that this war is not viable, and uh, we should not be involved in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the other alternative is this, okay, we, let's, let's, uh, I, I have the other alternative to go and join the France that wants to change the situation. Mm -hmm. So you were part of the group of guys that wanted to change the system because this they weren't happy the with system. the system. Yeah. Okay. So when you decided to, what was the reaction of people in the country? Because Ethiopia is, is seen as this big enemy of Somalia, and for people to go there, it was like a kind of like a traitor, a little bit. Is that what they say, Somalia? Well, the, a lot of people use yeah. to, they consider us as traitors. Yeah. And they are. Uh, not only traitors, but are also backstabbers. Backstabbers, yes. You are going to the, the enemy land. Yes. yes. And why you are going to the enemy land? Some people were saying that. Mm -hmm. But the people were not having a vision. We are having inside the country itself, mm -hmm. within us, a person who is another theorizer who wants to not make the country viable, yes. not you can't ask to help someone who is under another rule mm -hmm. while you are under another dictatorship rule. Mm -hmm. You see, this is, this is the problem. Was. Very interesting. So when we come back from the break, we're going to talk a little bit more about what happened when you got to Ethiopia. Because this is very interesting to me. I like to know a little bit more information. You're watching Integration on Somali National Television. We'll be back right after these messages. Gortad uhilo da dakan kaga o adga alota dulki hoyo at edi o kurof de la he common nice day ocean airlines ayakule in a keno in a soca kia ocean airlines wa diarat somaliet o diar kugo ahadal hiski delko hoyo wa hai anku to hai ocean airlines wa diarat de kelia at afriya la bata kisaki if sekerto shabakada internet ka wa spetel kilis wi kuso de wa da nolosha maan in hi guraga dulaya ocean airlines kupi hi kana ipsu Shabakata Ocean slash Airlines dot com. Hi, I'm Ramla, owner of Studio Glam. Welcome to our new facility where we offer hair, makeup, and henna in one location. Visit us at your local one stop shop, Studio Glam, hair, makeup, and henna. If you're looking for real Somali food, look no further than Bilal Restaurant. Toronto's Hidden Secret offers you a cozy, comfortable environment with freshly cooked Somali food. Enjoy your choice of delicious Somali rice, steak chicken, and their specialty of various roasted goat meat. Bilal Restaurant is located at 321 Ruxdale Boulevard at Martin Grove. Bilal Restaurant, your place for real Somali food. Welcome back to Integration, the first English television for Somalis around the world. We're still here chatting with my dad, Mr. Aidan Alea, and we're talking about his journey in Somalia as a diaspora coming back. Now, before we went to the break, Dad, we were talking about, you know, when you and a few others decided to go to Ethiopia at the time. Um, I think some of the, can you share with us some of the other people that were part of it? I know Abdullahi Yusuf, Abdullahi Naharisto was one of the men that was there, right? Ahmed Hamas Silayu okay. was one of them. And a lot of officers from the northern 
part of Somalia, mm -hmm. and also from the Mediterranean area. Okay. A lot of them, and also from groups from Hawiya as well. Mm -hmm. Was there, yeah. Adid was there too, right? Uh, Adid was a supporter, but yeah. he was in jail at that time. Okay. He was not uh, being able to, to join us mm -hmm. immediately at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of people from all clans, different clans, were all over there. Yeah, and I know also the author, Ayan Hirsi, uh, in her autobiography, she wrote that her father was there. Um, I don't know his name, but he, she said yeah, that yeah. her dad was one of the men that was part yeah, of that group. Yeah, yeah. So when you got there, was it the vision that, that you had for these men? Or like, what was the, when you got there, was everything together? Well, it, it, it was not everything together. Mm -hmm. The Ethiopians were trying to put everything together. Mm -hmm in order to find one front against the system. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, I and some uh, people from Somalia, mm -hmm. whether from the north or south of Somalia, mm -hmm. uh, had a meeting with Mangistu and uh, his le leadership and people in his government. And we told them without unifications mm -hmm. of all the Somalis, against the Siad Barre, we cannot do anything, any harm or anything mm -hmm. to Siad Barre regime. Mm -hmm. Siad Barre regime will be there mm -hmm. as long as we are divided. Yes. And we have to be united and you have to try as much as possible to unite us and to uh, show us the unifications uh, benefits of being unified front rather than a more than one front. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More than one front would bring civil war. Yes. Everybody would, would want to have the power. Mm -hmm. So, but one unified program, one unified force, one unified group will, will make the country better. Mm -hmm. And then what was the response of the Ethiopian government? That the time? Ethiopian were very responsive, mm -hmm. but the Somalis were not that responsive. So when they got to Ethiopia, they couldn't even get along, the people that were among trying them, to... Among themselves. Wow. Among themselves. So do you think the vision changed because of egos? Like what happened? The, it, I mean, I can only imagine having Sinlanyo and Abdullah Yusuf all in the same room vying for power. Like it just seems very strange, right? Uh, the same thing has happened. Mm -hmm. That what was what was scary. Mm -hmm. Silanyo was for Somali unifications, mm -hmm. and don't forget, Silanyo was born in Taleh. Really? Yeah. Wow. And his family, mm -hmm. his uncles, were the people who were immediately the the consultant, the advisors of Muhammad Abdullah Hassan. Wow. Hachi Sudi. In a Shahiri. Shahiri. Hachi Sudi. Or are his uncles? He himself, Sulayu, was born in Taleh. Wow. So when he, when all these people got to Ethiopia, they were originally all thinking about unification and overthrowing the government. But when they got there, everybody had different ideologies. Yes, we had some people who came from Saudi Arabia. Ah. And Saudi Arabia has a different ideology. Mm -hmm. They don't want, they were against Siad Barre, not because he was a dictator, because he, he announced cat, uh, what he calls scientific socialism as his ideology okay. of his regime. Okay. So the Saudis consider scientific socialism as agnotism. Okay, so they were against that philosophy. Like they were against that from the What beginning. philosophy do they want for Somalia at that time? Well, it would have been a socialist system. Yes. People putting efforts together, mm -hmm. working together, and solving their clan problems together. Yes. In a justified, injustice way. So when the Saudi people kind of got in the middle of the Somalis in Ethiopia, that's when the group kind of fell apart or? For the, yeah, the Saudi Arabia, 
the, the, we could not get united front between the SNM, mm -hmm. Somali National Movement, and the SSDF, Somali's Salvation Democratic Party front. They couldn't get together and form one front. Wow. Yeah. So at that point, what were you thinking? Like you were thinking. Well, I, well, I, I was thinking that uh, the, the, this, the whole thing mm -hmm. will not be viable. Yeah. So I said, let me save my children and family out of this uh, coming tragedy. Yeah. So I decided to leave and I went to Egypt, mm -hmm. from, so to Syria first, mm -hmm. and then from Syria I went to Egypt, and then I went to, to the United Nations, mm -hmm. and I asked for asylum, yes. to be, and to be resettled somewhere in the world. Tell me this, were there others who taught, like who had the same thinking as you did, to take their families out? In a, lot it, of, a lot of people, I. I instigated a lot of people to yes. do the same thing, yes. and some of them went to United Kingdom, mm -hmm. some went to France, some went to uh, some part of uh, Europe, mm -hmm. or West, Western Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, all those countries that are ac accepted asylum seekers at that time. Yeah. So, but the people who stayed behind, they decided to overthrow the government. They said, but they failed. They, they failed. didn't do it. They didn't do it. The regime dismantled itself by itself. Yes. Because of the time and the people were became internal. Yes. People inside the country mm -hmm. started to revolt. Yes. Yeah. So at that point, um, what was it like the last day when you leaving, when you were like leaving the group? What happened that last day? When you did, how did you tell them? Like, how do you tell Sin Layo, I'm out? <clears throat> This well, is, uh, you know. I, I told them that this is not going to be viable. Yeah. If there is no unity, there won't be anything yeah. for the Somali people. So I'm leaving. And on this way, I left. Some of them stayed behind. Mm -hmm. Let's try it. Let's try it. Let's try it. Let's try it. In, individually, we can do Front, front, clan, clan. No. no. And this is what has happened after the fall of Siad Barret. North divided, mm -hmm. Bari divided, mm -hmm. Magadisho area divided, mm -hmm. Baidaba divided, everyone was divided, division, division. Yeah, so everybody kind of created their own little houses. Yeah, yeah, everybody wanted to keep his own rule, his own government, his own ruling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, how did they take it when you told them I'm leaving? Well, uh, I, th I think. Uh, and most of them didn't like it. They took the, some of them look up to it that uh, I have uh, betrayed the movement mm -hmm. because uh, you, you did well at the beginning mm -hmm. and now you are leaving. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people also that I inspired to join the front mm -hmm. and to come out of the country mm -hmm. and to leave the government position were not happy as well. Yeah, they felt disappointed probably because disappointed. You, the leader was leaving the, the yeah, crew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the interesting thing is that, you know, when you realize a mistake is made, isn't it better to correct yourself? Because it seems like they stayed behind knowing that without having a unity to try to correct the system, they wouldn't be able to do it. But they stayed behind. Why would they stay behind, yeah. do you think? Because they have no other alternative. Where are they going to? Yeah. Everybody who did not have a vision yeah. where to go. Yeah. I, I had a world, I traveled the world before that, mm -hmm. and I knew how the world works yes. and how the international organization works. Mm -hmm. So I made advantage of my knowledge of, yes. the, of, of, of knowing that I have alternative. Yes. But you encouraged all of them to come together as Somalis. I encouraged them, yeah. of course. It is it's, without uh, coming together, we can defeat Siad Barre. Yeah. Yeah. So then when that happened, when you saw that they weren't interested in the plan to come together, to work together, to basically correct the system, um, do you feel that that's the biggest cause today of what's happening because people are not united to come together? It is part of that. Yeah. It's part of that. But the unfortunate side of it is, is some of the leaders, 
that were there at that time mm. are still leading both sides. Yes. And this is the unfortunate side. Mm -hmm. So the old generation is still in power. Still, still people who thought that mentality mm -hmm. is this, why should I unite? Mm -hmm. I can rule here. Mm -hmm. I can be a, a, the ruler here. Why should I give my uh, power and authority to another person, to, to the unknown? Wow. Yeah. So it's almost like the same philosophy 30 of yeah. 35 yeah. years later. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. It's unfortunate, it's unfortunate. So we'll continue our conversation. We're going to come back right after the break and wrap up as we talk with my father about his Sabali history. We'll be back right after these messages. Gorta do you know the duck and caga or at the alota dulki hoya at the Yokur of the Lahi Common Nice Day Ocean Airlines Ayakole in a cano in a soca area. Ocean Airlines, what the Arab Somaliet or the Arco go at the Hiski Delco Hoyo. Why I'm put a high ocean or lines, what the Arab the Kelia and Afria Labata Kasaki if Sakerto Shabakada Internet Kawa is better kill this way. Kuso do what the Noloshama and if you rag a dulaya. Ocean Airlines, Kupi Kana Ipsu. Shabakataocean.com Welcome back to Integration. You're watching the first English TV for Somalis around the world. Thank you so much for joining us. We're still having an intimate conversation with the one and only, my father, Ahmed Saeed Nalea. So, Dad, I want to thank you so much for still being here with us. Um, before the break, we were talking about when you left Ethiopia. And um, so I wanted to kind of go into what lessons do you think that you've learned from being like in Ethiopia at that time? The first lesson I learned is without unific, unified Somali people, mm -hmm. they cannot change anything. This is the first lessons I learned. The other thing also, I learned very strongly how our neighbors are very, uh, very minded, mm -hmm. uh, set-minded about uh, the Somali people, mm -hmm. because part of Ethiopia is occupied, is residents of part of Ethiopia, particularly the Ugadian area, or most of it is the residents are Somalis. The yeah. people there are Somalis. The same thing, the other neighbor, Kenya, mm -hmm. the same thing. A lot of Somalis in the NFD, Northern Frontier District, mm -hmm. are Somalis. Mm -hmm. And all our neighbors are not very comfortable mm -hmm. with unified Somalia, which has happened in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And to disintegrate that was not a good idea at all. Mm -hmm. So why do you think they're so uncomfortable with that idea of Somalis being united? The neighbors, because if the Somalis are united, mm -hmm the neighbors are going to lose power in some parts of the country. Ah, okay. In their own country. Was this well known to the former president, Siad Bara? Did he always understand that concept? Siad Bara was very understandable to that concept. Mm -hmm. But he only acted on it after he has failed internally in the economical side of Somalia, of changing Somalia. Wow. So basically, when he couldn't uplift the country economically, he felt like he had to fight other battles. Yeah. He nationalized everything, mm -hmm. the economy. He made the economy a non-capitalist part of development. But at the same time, he didn't make it a non-capitalist part of development, but he made state capitalism. The government was controlling everything. Mm -hmm. What you eat in your own house, the bread you eat, the rice you eat, was controlled by the government. Wow. So was that a good or a bad thing? It was a bad thing. It was a bad thing. Because the people initiatives has gone out. Mm -hmm. You see. How were Sabalis taking that? Like the fact that they couldn't control any of the food? Like I mean, if you wanted to buy rice, you couldn't get it unless the government gave it to you. That have basically what it was, the system? Well, the people were not happy. Yeah. And they were uh, dismantled. But because the regime was so strong and were everywhere, they couldn't do much about it. They couldn't demonstrate until late, 
later on when the regime started to weaken. Ah. Yeah. So when the regime started to weaken, did it start in Mogadishu or did it start in other cities? In all over Somalia. All over in Somalia. all over Somalia. Mogadishu was one of the last, uh, what do you call it, uh, weapons that were used. Mm -hmm. Because Mogadishu was the capital of the country, yes. where all the government institutions were their headquarters. Mm -hmm. But we started from Bari, mm -hmm. Mudug mm -hmm. areas, uh, Hiran areas, mm -hmm. uh, Baidaba areas. People started to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the, the uh, for instance, uh, agricultural development agency were taking their produce like the sorghum mm -hmm. wheat mm -hmm. whatever they produce the government check it and they give them money according to the price they want mm -hmm. not according to the price of the market yes you see this is the problem it's a big problem so when the the government is controlling everything it looks like there might be a disparity of where the services can reach people. Like for instance, people, some people might not get food and some people might get food. So there must be a lot of uprising that happened because of that against the former president of Somalia, Siad Bure. At that time, the uprising could not have happened mm -hmm. because of the people were afraid of the government. Yes. But there was a lot of dissatisfactions yes. with the regime, with the government, with the institutions. Mm -hmm. Because people can have to go into line for a long time to get a kilo of rice, wow. a kilo of sorghum, a kilo of wheat, a, 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 a bag, a small can of oil wow. to cook food for your children. It was difficult. At this moment, did the former president know these dissatisfactions were happening? Yes, he knew that, but he couldn't do anything about it mm -hmm. because he don't have the resources to do it. Yeah. He don't have, he can't change the situations if he don't have the resources. And that as dissatisfaction grew, probably also his power lessened, right? Of course, the government power has become less mm -hmm. and the, the governor, the district commissioner, whoever was ruling at that time, or in the administration system, was unable to do anything. So they were sitting idle in their chairs, uh, waiting for orders, what to do about it. You see. If you had to do it again, would you still become a politician? Uh, yes, I would like to become a politician, but it has to be on a democratic basis. Yeah. People have to participate in what we do. No, I'm just thinking like it's, it's interesting to learn life lessons because sometimes we look back at our lives and, you know, do we think that, you know, politics sometimes doesn't serve the people, right? Well, sometimes, but with, I mean, all the time, there is always politics. <laughs> to serve people, you have to set a policy, first of all. Yes. And once you set the policy, the policy has to be viable for the situation that the people are in. That's very true. Mm. So do you think that the former government failed in that? Th this is one of the three main reasons for the failure. And the war with Ethiopia was the main cause of it. Mm -hmm. So when, what did the former um, president think of you leaving? Was he happy with something like that? Like he wasn't happy with people defecting and leaving, right? No, he was not happy, neither with me, nor with Silayo, yeah. nor with Abdullah Yusuf, who was an, a, a colonel in the armed forces at that wow. time. Mm -hmm. And he was a, a person, Abdullah Yusuf was also a, a person who was having a, cauc, a counter coup with him. Yes. His own groups was also trying to take over the power as well. Wow. Yeah, Abdullah Yusuf. Yes. So what do you think are the lessons learned now from all this for the greater of Somalis? Like, well, uh, well, obviously, we're not going to go into after you left the country. Obviously, the civil war broke out, you know, devastating things happened to many people in the country. So many millions of Somalis lost their lives. So now all over the world, Somalis are refugees and there's they're not even in their home countries, a lot of them. So 
What do you think is, what, what, what should we learn from all this? We have to learn that we have to go back to reality. We are one people, one nation, one language, one culture. We have to go and sit together and say, how can we solve our problem? And by solving our problem, we can reinstate, reinstate our institutions of government properly. And what do you think is the problem? The problem is that everybody wants to do a shortcut. Mm. And this is not viable. Mm -hmm. It's not a shortcut. He wants a rule for today. He's not thinking of tomorrow. He's not thinking of the long term. They have to think of the long term. Dialogue must be done with the North. And the North must come together and talk together with the South as they did it in 1959. Mm -hmm. they did this. Wow. So um, just kind of go back to that issue of like talking to each other. Why do you think it's historically hard? Is it hasn't been historically difficult for Somalis to talk to each other? Because I just can't imagine like when I travel there, I was I've been to all those cities that you mentioned, a lot of them, and the people are Somali. They all like they'll get along and talk to each other. Why is it hard government wise to talk to each other? It's, it's unfortunate. It, the, the people who are in power are trying to Keep that power. Yes. If, if, if a dialogue happened, a change will come mm. in government structure. And some of them are afraid. Yeah. They won't have a position, maybe. Wow. So this is maybe one of the reasons. Or uh, some of them may have nas nationalism. Yes. Eager, eagerism, the eager of being a nationalist on this issue. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. So what message do you want to share with young Somalis now? Because there's so many people like yourself now, like 30, 40 years later, who have this desire to go back home, rebuild their country, and who are activists out there trying to say, we are one Somalia, we are this. So what do you tell those hopeful dreamers? Because that's what they call them, everybody, dreamers, right? Dreamers, we can reinstate again the concept of one nation, one people, one language, one culture. Mm -hmm. We can reinstate it. Let's work together, all of us. Wow, that's pretty powerful. Do you think the leaders would agree with you on that? Whether they agree or not, but it's the reality there. Mm -hmm. This is the ambition of our people. Mm -hmm. They had it in the 60s and before the 60s, and they will have it today, and they still have it in their hearts. Wow, that's really powerful. Well, I want to thank you so much. I'm sure people are going to be like, bring your dad back. We want to talk to more about the old Somalia and the new Somalia. So thank you so much, Abbe, for joining us and uh, sharing your story. Uh, I think it's always important that the new generation knows the history of what came before them. So we appreciate you being here. You're I'm sure people are going to email me to bring you back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Have you. a good day. Thank you. You're watching Integration TV across Somalia on Television Karanka Somalia at SNTV. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, we're on YouTube 24 hours a day. You can catch us online and follow us on Twitter and Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram. You got it. Somali social media. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good evening.